All right, welcome back to the second part of the lecture on factorization mechanisms. We're finally gonna see new mechanisms for answering linear queries. So before we start talking about factorization, I'm gonna introduce a slightly cryptic but sort of general framework for how um, linear query release happens um, in certain practical applications. So let's suppose we switch fully to this histogram representation. So we're given a histogram representing a data set of size n and a set of linear queries. Well, we want to take advantage of certain structure in the queries. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to allow some approximation. So we might replace the queries with a slightly different but somehow easier set of queries. So um, we can talk about why it might be easier to answer a slightly different set of queries um, in a bit. And then what we can do is something called factor the queries. And the idea of factoring the queries is that we're going to split the queries into two phases, where the first is what's called a measurement phase. And this is where we actually these are the queries we actually answer with privacy. And then once we have those queries, we're going to do what's called a reconstruction phase. And this is just going to be post-processing where we take the answers we got to the queries defined by M and we transform them in a linear way. So if you remember the binary tree mechanism, we started by taking this special subset of all the interval queries. Those were the measurement queries. And then we had this clever way of reconstructing the answers to all the queries that weren't in the binary tree. And that was the reconstruction phase. So this factorization idea is going to be a generalization of what we saw. And uh, we're going to um, see that it can be quite, quite useful. And then finally, once we do this, we're going to get some vector of answers A prime that we got by reconstructing our measured queries. And we can do some post-processing again. So we're allowed to do any post-processing we want subject to differential privacy. And there's a couple of reasons you might want to do post-processing. So one of the reasons you might want to do this is to enforce that the queries you get are actually consistent with some data set. So for example, if I have two queries that are supposed to give the exact same answer, I don't know why, but if you did, you want to post-process to make sure that those two queries give the exact same answer. And maybe you also have certain prior beliefs Maybe someone told you the answer to some of the queries, and so now you want to fix that those are going to be exactly true, or you have some prior beliefs about the answer to the queries, and you want to do some kind of inference. So we're going to talk about ways to post-process. And the surprising thing is that the post-processing can actually, in some sense, eliminate a lot of the noise that was introduced in the earlier phases, which is a really surprising fact. So for today, uh, for the rest of this lecture, we're just going to talk about this factorization part, and we're going to talk about something I'll call the factorization mechanism. So we're going to ignore all the other parts for now and just talk about this factorization, and I'll come back and I'll mention approximation real quick. So what is factorization? So remember, given linear queries, um, f represented by some matrix, k queries, a universe of size n. We want to do something to take advantage of the fact that the queries may have some internal similarity between them. So um, for example, you know, what if all the queries are the same? All right, so let's look at an example real quick. Um, Okay, so let's look at an example real quick. So suppose all my queries are actually the exact same thing. Again, don't know why you would really want to do this, but let's just suppose all the queries are the same thing. Well, if you wanted to answer all the queries using the Gaussian mechanism, the sensitivity of the vector of queries is going to be proportional to square root of k if these are counts. So, you know, Gaussian mac adds noise. Uh, k to the one half over n. Okay, um, but of course you know that this is a silly thing to do. These queries should all give the same answer. There's just one query. So what if what you did was you just answered f one of x plus noise, and then you returned by post processing like a vector that was just k copies of a. 
Okay, so like just by staring at these queries, you know that a better thing to do is to just run the Gaussian mechanism on the first query, which will give you noise about one over n if it's a count, and then just copy the answer into the remaining queries. Okay, so um, improved mechanism. adds noise just one over n, because really at the end of the day, all we're doing is answering a single count. Okay, well, these are counts. Okay, but, but either it doesn't really matter what the sensitivity of the query is, we answer noise proportional, we add noise proportional to the sensitivity of the query, not sensitivity times root k. All right, so um, by using the fact that these queries have some internal similarity, we can do a lot better. So let's see what this looks like in like matrix notation. So we have um, some vector of queries, or some matrix of queries, and the matrix itself has the following form. Okay, the matrix is just like some query repeated k times. Okay, so like in my example, k is four. But we're saying, look, we're not going to measure, we're not going to actually answer all these queries. What we're actually going to do is we're really only going to answer a single query. It's just going to, in this case, be like the first row of f. So now we get like a new set of queries. And I can denote this by m, where m is like some other linear queries. <laughs> like, some, like m is like some other linear query. It's just a single linear query. But it's like some other linear query release problem I could have been asked to solve. And I'm going to reconstruct the answers by like copying the answer I get, which is just like one number, into a whole vector. So the way that's going to work is I'm going to take this vector of all ones. And I can also call this a matrix R. All right. And the nice thing is that if I take this whole thing, like R times M is the same matrix. So if I take this histogram, whatever it is, these things are the same. And what that means is that if I just, like, I don't have to take the matrix R times M and answer it. I can just answer M times the histogram and then apply R to the output. OK, so what I mean by that is um, that instead of answering f times the histogram plus Gaussian noise, I can actually answer m times the histogram plus Gaussian noise. That gives me some vector of answers. And then I can multiply that whole thing by r. And what I get when I distribute is the original queries I wanted, f times the histogram, plus some other noise distribution, r times z. So I'm getting a different mechanism because I'm transforming the noise by this matrix r. Okay, And the reason this might be nice is that maybe z has very small entries, for example. So making the, you know, maybe z has, is much less noise because I'm only answering the queries in m. And so maybe r times z is like less noise than z itself. OK, like it's important to note that like z is not the same in the two sides. One of them is proportional to the sensitivity of f. Okay, So here, like this is proportional to the sensitivity of f. And this one is proportional to the sensitivity of m. OK, so maybe the, in this case, you can see that, like in my example, you can see that the sensitivity of m is a lot lower than the sensitivity of f. On the other hand, I'm multiplying like by r. So it's, it's not actually like immediately clear if we're winning. But in this example, like it's clear that we're winning. All right, so this is what I'm calling a factorization mechanism, because I'm taking f and I'm factoring it into a product r times m. Okay, so like it's literally factoring the matrix F into a product of two matrices. 
um, to make sure we get like the types right. Uh, like M is going to be an L by M matrix where L is something, doesn't matter. And R is going to be like a K by L matrix. So we get the types right that like R times M has the same shape as F. And of course we want that, um, we want that uh, to also equal. So let's sort of analyze this mechanism in general. So we can define for like R and M such that R times M equals F. We can define like M of R comma F of a data set to be the mechanism that outputs R times M of the histogram plus Z, which is equal to F times the histogram plus R times Z, where Z is like a normal whose noise is calibrated to be proportional to the sensitivity of the matrix M because I'm actually only worried about preserving privacy for M. Right? So we're using the fact that by post-processing, it's enough to make this private. Okay, so we're only worried about making the queries M private, and then we're going to apply the reconstruction matrix to the noisy answers. And that's equivalent to answering the linear queries with some other Gaussian noise R times Z. Okay, so like we could have just defined the mechanism as F plus R times Z, but we're kind of using the factorization to argue that it's enough, enough noise, or like to figure out how much noise we have to add in Z. Okay, so First of all, like remember, we're adding effectively correlated Gaussian noise because even though Z has independent entries, R times Z will have some like correlated entries. And so that's where we're kind of winning over the original mechanism, right? So like, this is like correlated Gaussian noise. And in fact, um, it's not so important, but the distribution of this noise is mean zero, and its covariance matrix is sigma squared times R R transpose. So like R R transpose is like the covariant, it's telling us what covariance to use. Um, so like you can check, for example, that in the previous case, um, what we get is a Gaussian where the noise we add is exactly the same on every entry. So we add like one Gaussian to like one copy of a Gaussian to, to every entry instead of independent Gaussian noise. And that's why we're winning. All right, so like let's analyze the error. So remember, like the thing we want to analyze, um, let me go to a new page. So the, the thing we want to analyze, so for fixed. factorization, r times m equals f, the error is like the expected value of r times z over k to the 1 half. All right, so let's try to analyze like the expected L2 error of this mechanism for like a particular factorization. All right, so like what is that thing? So first of all, uh, let me do a little rearranging. Okay, so first of all, let's look at this thing. So we gotta make a vector z1, z2 through zl because there's like L queries we measure. <laughs> And now we're multiplying that vector by a matrix R, and I'm going to write R as having rows like R1, R2, Rk. 
All right, and what this means is that like the answers we get out are gonna be like r1.z, r2.z, rk.z. Okay, so like if we wanna answer query i, we take the ith row of r and we take the dot product with the noise vector z. All right, so let's like take a look at what is like that random variable. So note that like ri dot z is equal or is distributed as sorry I should so like z i uh, is distributed as n zero sigma squared and they're all independent or nah, but sorry let me change this up so z is normal zero sigma squared and like independent on every coordinate. Okay, so r dot z is distributed as a normal whose mean is zero and whose variance is sigma squared times the L2 norm squared of ri. All right, so I think we stated this fact when we talked about um, the Gaussian mechanism, but if you don't remember it, this is just like a fact. So you can derive this from the fact that all the coordinates of z are independent and um, just the definition of variance. Okay, so what this means is that the expected value of like ri dot z squared is equal to sigma squared times the squared two norm of ri, the ith row of r. All right, so um, let's just keep that fact in mind. So now, like, what is the actual thing we want to bound? So let's let's like switch to actually bounding the thing we want. So first of all, we want to bound the two norm of R z divided by this normalization factor k to the one half, and like. This thing is at most, or sorry, let me get rid of the k to the one half. It'll just, the k to the one half will just make our life a little trickier. Okay, so we want to bound the two norm of r times z. And first we'll use the fact that this thing is at most the square root of r times z, like all squared. Okay, so this is by something called Jensen's inequality, um, Cauchy-Schwartz. Uh, it's not important why it's true if you don't see this, but it's useful that we can bound it by the square root of the squared two norm, or the, the square root of the expectation of the square. Okay, so what's this thing? This is the expectation of like the sum over all the queries of ri dot z squared all to the one half. And the linearity of expectation, this is the sum of all the queries of the expected value of ri dot z squared. And we said that this thing is the sum of sigma squared times the two norm squared of ri. So first we can like pull the sigma out and then we can expand the norm so this is like the sum of i equals one to k times the sum of j equals one to l of r i comma j all squared to the one half. Now, if you look at this double sum, it's basically taking the sum over the square of every single entry of the matrix and then taking the square root of that. So this has a name. It's called the Frobenius norm 
of the matrix R. But again, really what it is, is it's like you take this matrix that's K by L and you write it as one K times L dimensional vector. And you take the L2 norm of that vector. Okay, so it's like not super important why it's called the Frobenius norm. It's just like the L2 norm of the matrix treated as a vector. Okay, so you just like forget that the vec that the matrix is a matrix. You just treat it as like a list, like a vector of numbers, and take the L2 norm. Okay, so it's called the Frobenius norm. All right, and then if you plug in our definition of sigma, which is noise calibrated to the sensitivity of M, what you get for this whole thing is big O of C times epsilon times this Frobenius norm of R times this special one to two norm of M all divided by N, all right? And like lastly, if we just put like a one over k to the one half out in front of all these things, which was what we original what we actually wanted for our notion of error. We get a factor of k to the one half. Okay, so we'll just push that all through by linearity. Alright, so like this whole nasty thing. is the error of the mechanism for like a particular factorization, the expected error with a particular factorization, or at least it's an upper bound on the expected error with that particular factorization. And what you can actually check is that this thing can be better. So um, like a good exercise is if you look at my sort of simple example above, like check that, or, uh, copy, paste. Okay, so like good examples here. So exercise one for my example of k copies of a single query. What is, first, what is the sensitivity of the whole vector of queries? And then what is the error of the factorization mechanism for my factorization. And exercise two is express the binary tree mechanism as a factorization. So by that, what I mean is like, what is the matrix of queries F? What is the um, measurement matrix M? What is the reconstruction matrix R? And like, what are the norms, the relevant norms of all those things? So this is a little tricky. So maybe like, do this for you know M equals eight. Like, don't do this for like arbitrary M. It's like just a mess to write out you know, get a sense of how it works in general. All right, so I'm gonna go on, um, but these are useful exercises. I wanna say like one quick thing. So I'm gonna call, I'm gonna define a mechanism, like we, we said that the error for a given factorization Rm equals F, is like the following quantity. It's big O of um, C, depending on the privacy parameters, over N 
times this quantity, which is some norm of r times some norm of n over k to the 1 half. Now, like, of course, we should just, you know, we know what f is. So we should actually just try to, like, optimize that thing. Okay, so we should just try to, like, minimize the, uh, we, should, we should just try to, like, minimize the error that we'll get if we run the mechanism with a particular factorization r and m. So, like, before we run the mechanism, let's just, like, optimize these things. And there's, in fact, like a name for the, um, for like the quantity that you get when you come up with the best factorization R times M, and it's actually called a matrix factorization norm. So we can define uh, gamma of F, so gamma is like a notation for the factorization norm, to be like the minimum of this thing. So the Frobenius norm of R times this like one to two norm of M divided by K to the one half, where we maximize over like all factorizations uh, of the form, you know, F equals R times M. All right, and this turns out to actually be like a tractable optimization problem. or at least it's like polynomial time in the like size of the matrices, although I already said that the size of the matrices is like actually enormous um, in some cases, but this is like a nice like structured optimization problem. It's what's called convex. You can, you can solve it in polynomial time in the size of F, which is actually a pretty cool uh, and highly non-obvious fact. But what this means is we can say that this quantity gamma of f is like something we can always achieve. So what we get is that there's always a mechanism. So for every uh, query matrix f expressible as like k times m, there is an epsilon delta dp algorithm with error um, order depending on the privacy parameters times gamma of the matrix times n. Okay, so there is sort of a family of mechanisms that can give us this error bound where the error bound is stated in terms of some special norm of the matrix F that's based on this idea of factorization. And since F is just something that's given to us, it's not private data, we're free to like do whatever we want to try to solve this optimization problem and come up with mechanisms. So like you can think of the binary tree mechanism as some kind of like approximate solution to this optimization problem, but like you could also have just taken the query matrix for all the interval queries and like stuck it into some magic optimizer and found like a particular factorization R times M that would, you know, in some ways resemble the binary tree, but like, you know, would be like some mechanism you came up with by kind of search and optimization rather than by, um, you know, by like coming up with it using your own like personal cleverness. Um, so that's kind of the, the theorem about factorization. And um, we're going to stop there. One quick point I want to make before we go is that there's different flavors of this factorization mechanism. So one thing you could consider is, you know, what if I didn't want to get epsilon delta dp? I wanted to get epsilon zero dp. Well, then the noise I would add would have to be proportional to the L1 sensitivity of some queries. And there's another matrix norm I can put in here instead of 1 to 2 that defines the L1 sensitivity. It's not so important what it is, but there's like some other optimization problem where we optimize for the L1 sensitivity of M instead of the L2 sensitivity. And 
you know, another thing you might ask is like, what if I don't want the error to be small only in this kind of L2 sense? I want it to be small for every query. Well, then, you know, I get a different optimization problem for R. What's important now is not optimizing this thing called the Frobenius norm, but instead I want to optimize something like the largest norm of any row of R. And that's a separate optimization problem and gives you like a different, you know, optimization problem you can solve. So one kind of remark is that different variants of privacy and different error goals give uh, related optimization problems. Okay, but there's sort of like a general framework here, which is like once you know the sensitivity you're going to care about and the error metric you care about, you can figure out how to express the overall error of the mechanism in terms of some like norm, some factorization based norm, and you can try to like solve for that thing. So um, that's it for this class. Um, in the next class, I'll briefly touch on approximate factorization where we don't care about, we can relax the constraint that R times M is exactly equal to F, which will be like a second source of error. And then I'll talk a lot about post-processing. So that's it for this lecture, and I will see you in class. Thanks.